You are on to a life transforming experience as Pastor Prince Abba brings you God's word with deep insights and power. God bless you. You are on to a life transforming experience as Pastor Prince Abba brings you God's word with deep insights and power. God bless you. Three persons here who are going out with a supernatural breakthrough. Three. I heard specifically three. 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 Supernatural breakthrough. This grace is for all though, but there are some people who are going to swim in a deeper level of it. There are some whose level would be the hundredfold. There are some whose level would be the sixtyfold. There are some whose level will be the thirtyfold. There are some whose level will be the sevenfold. I don't know which level you want to swim into, but you're swimming into a deeper level. Into a deeper level. Into a deeper level. There are three persons who are getting into a deeper level. A deeper level. Three persons here. A deeper level. A deeper level of grace. A deeper level of grace. This is your year of double grace. Are you hearing what I'm saying? I say it's your year of double grace. Whether you say amen to it or not, it's your business. But it's your year of double grace. You are not the only one who is in this year of double grace. I'm the one. I'm the one who is more concerned about it. I'm the one who is more particular about it. I'm craving more for it than you are even craving for it. Not one thing God has in store for me eluded me this year. Not one God has for you. Hallelujah. It's not going to be by my strength. It's not going to be by my efforts. It's going to be on the basis of what Jesus has already done. That's the basis God has given me the cities. That's the basis God is giving me the nations. That's the basis God is giving me territories. It's not going to be because of how much I have done. That's the kind of thing that gets God angry when you try to approach Him on the premises of your own strength, on the premises of what you have done, on the premises of your own accomplishment. That is what turns Him off. That is what turns him up because the land you want to possess, the territories you want to take have already been taken. That is what you don't know. There are already big sacks swimming in the areas where you want to swim. Nothing is in vacuum in nature. Nature anything in vacuum. I say even in that business you are operating now, there are big sharks in it. You can't take that business by your own strength. Is it in academics? Is it in media? How do you want to play and beat Larry King? How do you want to do that, my friend? How do you want to get what is her name? I'm I'm poor out of the game. How do you want to do that? Is it in academics? How do you want to beat men like Wole Shoinka? How do you want to beat those guys by your own muscles? No, you'll be wasting your time. They are stronger than you. Whether you like it or yes. Psalm chapter 44. If you read, you see what God, the account you know, of God's mighty deliverance on the children of Israel. That land was not subdued because they were mighty in number. After all, they were small. They were small in number. The children of Israel didn't take Canaan because of their abilities. It was not because Joshua was skillful with the sword. It was because God was mighty. God went ahead of them. This is a land that giants already occupied. The children of Anarchists, they already subdued the land. They were poor, very, very hefty, some 11 feet. Can you imagine that? And these are small children, small 20 years, 22, 25. Those were the ones who Joshua was going to lead into. Little, little children. How 
were they going to beat these guys down? How were they going to do that? Men who had already taken over that territory. It was by the mighty hand. Maybe I should show you. Go to the book of why you're standing over before we sit down. It's good you know this before I get into what I want to talk to you about now. So you understand the need for grace. You need this stuff called grace. Go to the book of Psalm chapter 44 quickly. Let me read it from this. Um, okay. From this. Let me take it from this one. Oh God, we have heard with our ears. Our fathers have told us the works that thou didst in the days, in the days of the old. Not the works you did. The works that God alone did. Verse 2. Thou with thine own hand didst drive out the nations. Then thou didst plant them. Thou didst afflict the peoples. Then thou didst spread abroad. Spread them abroad. For by their own sword they did not possess the land. And their own arm did not save them. But thy right hand and thy arm and the light of thy presence. For thou didst favor them. It was not by the skillfulness of the sword of Jacob, of what is his name? Sorry, Joshua, that that land was subdued. Mm-mm. It was not by their numbers. Can I tell you something? It is not going to be by your abilities that you will take nations. It's not going to be by your abilities that you subdue kingdoms. It's not going to be by your abilities that you win territories. It's not going to be by your intellect that you do business. It's going to be because God has by his right hand by his own arm stretched arms outstretched arms by his presence it's going to be on that basis that he's going to deliver you how do you think the walls of Jericho was brought down you know some of you have a misconception of that miracle or that whatever it was not a falling wall that got those guys into that wall didn't fall actually scientists have been able to do a, um, an excavation of what happened to that war. They were thinking, they were wondering, how could a mighty war of this caliber fall? How possible under the planet, under this earth, how possible could that war have fallen? Because when they discovered, when they did an analysis on that war, they discovered that that war was so thick, it was so large, that 12 chariots could run on it. Not 12 horses, my friend. 12 chariots. You know what it means? That's a horse carrying a big cat behind it. Twelve chariots could run on that wall. What is also amazing is that people even had their houses on that wall. If the wall became a foundation, people could build their houses on top of it. That was the wall few men were going to bring. How could you? The Bible said, when the children of Israel blew their trumpet and sang, that war, it didn't fall, it sank. Let me tell you how it sank. You know, there are angels in heaven who's just one arm of them is ten of you put together or more. Just one of their arms or one of their legs. Those were the warring angels God released from heaven. He didn't need to release so much. Just twelve of them is enough. Just landed on the wall. As they were landing, brrr, the wall was just sinking inside. That is what happened though. That is the kind of miracle you will get in this service today. You know, there are wars that have stood against you, your finances. Wars that have risen against your career. Wars that have risen against your ministry. There, there, there's going to be a supernatural release on your behalf this morning. And angels are going to come from on high. That is why when I worship God, I know I release them. I don't just worship because I like singing or because I know how to sing. Mm-mm. I worship because I know what it does, what it does in the realm of the spirit. So when those Please, they start fighting on my behalf. I know it. The area where you want to do whatever you want to do in life, call it business, academics, whatever, there are guys who are already doing big. 
put into the telecommunication industry is already huge. You want to get into um, communication, my friend, you're going to have to do a lot of work. Oh, if you have to go by your own ability, you need grace. I said, whatever. There are people, giants, big ones, fenced around that place. The money you're believing God for are in the hands. They're in the hands of sitting giants. You need grace to subdue such people. Grace. Grace is called God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense, not on your own expense. It is God's riches at God's riches at Christ's expense. It is what Jesus did on the cross that will make you take nations. Are you hearing what I'm talking about? That is what will make you take nations. That is how I know it. When we talk about taking nations, even in soul winning, it is on the basis of the first word, you win souls. If you go out there with your own ability, you think it's because you have the ability, you have the word, the eloquence and all that. You're not going to get anything done for Christ. It's on the basis of what Christ has done. You know, this is what is going. Jesus is the one who does the job. So all I need to do is come on that basis. Christ, you have done this job already. So I'm just keen in a whole laborer. It's on the basis of grace that I can win souls into your kingdom. Church growth happens on the basis of grace. It's on the basis of grace. Financial growth, whatever you call it, it happens. When I caught this revelation, I discovered I don't need too much of calculation again to take nations. All I need is just too much of grace. Not too much of calculations. Not too much of analysis. I don't even need your help, my friend. I don't, because what grace does is that it suspends human efforts. When grace comes, it doesn't matter who is helping you or not. It suspends human effort and makes God your efforts. Are you hearing what I'm talking about right now? It makes God your ability. It makes God your enablement. It makes God your energy. It makes God your driving factor. You don't need humans again. The day dawned on me, I discovered not what anybody is doing can put me down. Can you see the way I reacted to the service yesterday? It didn't bug me whatever happened. It didn't bug me who didn't come or not. Why? Because I know it. It's not you who called me. It's grace that elected me. The Bible said that our election is an election of grace. So I don't owe you any apology, my friend. I don't owe you any explanation. I don't owe you any plea. Why? Because grace elected me. It's not my ability that will bring... What I do is when I get in now, I lift up my hands. God, wherever the best brain are for this ministry, bring them for me. Those ones who will bring them for me. By grace. Not Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? Are you hearing me? So it's going to be by grace. I already know the formula. It's not in begging people, my friend. I want to beg all of you ministers in this house. Those of you who are following me closely. Don't beg people. If you beg people, you destroy the grace of God functioning. Go back to the altar of grace. Go back to the cross. That is where you activate the thing. Don't beg people to do what is useful for them. Just hook up to grace. I have decided in 2015, I am not going to beg any man, not for money, not for help, not for anything. I am going to stay with grace. It's grace that makes men do the job. It's grace that compels people to come around you. Not how much you know how to beg them. You know, this year I'm not going to be saying thank you so much. Oh. Trust me. I'm not going to be saying thank you to man so much. If any guy is doing the job he's supposed to be doing, I'm going to say thank you, grace. Because it's not you who is doing it. It's grace. Anytime you make people look so indispensable, you suspend grace. Because God wants to take the glory. He said his glory will share with no man. The only thing he can share with you is the benefits. <laughs> God wants the glory, but he wants to give you the benefits. So he doesn't want people to say, hey, it's because of you and your laptop that we are recording the message. If you like, keep it at home. If you like, lock it up in the prison. It's not our business. It's not because of whether you showed up for service or not that we are going to go to nations. Mm-mm. It's going to be because of grace. It's not going to be because whether you showed up or not. It's not going to be because of that. 
Don't think you're doing God a favor, my friend. It's on the premises of grace. The day this truth dawned on me, I stopped worrying about any what worrying about what anybody's doing. It doesn't bug me again. It doesn't bug me. It doesn't bug me. Let me show you something quickly before you sit down. I like the way you're standing. It's good. Because you don't know what I do, what happens to me when I stand here all day and all that. Grace cannot function without goals. This year, I want to beg all of you, you need to set kingdom goals and personal goals. These are the two goals you need to set for your life this year. If you want to see grace function, grace only comes on someone who has a target to hit. Grace doesn't come on someone without a target. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Grace only comes on someone who has a target to meet. And there are two kinds of targets you need to set for your life. One is kingdom target. Number two, personal goals. If you don't have a goal this year, Actually, in this service, one of the things you're going to do is to write out at least five goals you want to achieve this year. Five goals. You're going to write it on paper. You're going to keep one in your house. Then you're going to bring one to the altar. Don't do that now. Towards the end of the service, you have to remind me to get that done. You just have to remind me to get that done. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So, you need goals. So, five goals you're going to achieve for yourself this year. Five solid goals. Five solid goals. Don't make them too much. Just concentrate on five. You know, God, this is the area where I'm battling with. Maybe finances. Maybe whatever. These are the five major areas I'm having issues with. These are the goals I'm setting. These are the practical steps I want to. Because in this service, there's going to be a falling of the anointing. Outpouring of the anointing. Such an unusual anointing that will come on every life, that will come on every ghost. I mean, on this altar, there's fire already. It's going to come so mightily. And the kind of speed you enjoy in achieving that ghost. I know what I'm saying. I know what I'm talking about right now. It's one of the things you're going to do in this service. You're going to map out goals. And the rain of grace will come on them. Because the battle is not to the swift, nor the race. Or the battle is not to the strong, or the race to the swift. It is of God that showed grace and mercy. Number two, kingdom goes. Now let me let you know something. God does not take people into rest when he finds them in disobedience. Whether you like it or not, go and mark it QED. When God catches you in a place of disobedience, you are just destroying your life. If you don't put God's kingdom first in your life, don't look for anything. Don't look for anything. I beg you. Don't bother. It doesn't matter how many times you scream it, how many times you... I took time in this conference to show you the various ways you can activate this grace. It's true. Grace is not a mirage. Grace functions when God sees that you put what concerns him first. That's the truth. The principle is first to seek God's kingdom and his righteousness. Then all other things, all other things, all other things will be added. If you don't have kingdom goals you are going to pursue this year, I want to beg you in this service, write them down. What are the goals you are going to pursue in the area of soul winning? This is God's heartbeat. Two things God is primarily concerned about. Number one is his worship. Number two, number two is his kingdom. And when you talk about you talk about people. If you talk about God's kingdom, what God is concerned with, or what God is concerned about is souls. That's the only reason for which he gave up his son as the last sacrifice. You don't know what it costs God. If you have a revelation of what it costs God us to die on the cross for the remission of man's sin you are not going to play with this factor of grace you are not going to play with this factor you are not going to play with kingdom issues how much can you give God to tell him thank you for what he did for you for the salvation you enjoy for the salvation you enjoy how much can you say thank you to God just tell me how much 
what God expects is just to worship me. Then be interested in my kingdom. That is what I am interested in. It's not interested in any other thing. That's what is interested. Look at all these people I sent my son to die for. Please, reach out to them. They need to know what he did for them. Reach out to them with this gospel. They need to know what I did for them. Not so many persons know it. You are the one who is supposed to go and reach out to them. That is how God will begin to release this grace on your behalf. But if you keep putting your eyes on your own thing, you want to do it your own way. You want to achieve it your own. My, my. Every time you're looking at what you will achieve for yourself, what you will get for yourself, and God's kingdom is neglected, God is also going to neglect you. I'm showing you the secret for enjoying grace this year. Put his kingdom first. It doesn't matter what you are or who you are, what you do. Whether you are a student, you are a businessman, you are a politician, you are whoever, you are a copper, I don't care what you do. You need to put God's kingdom at the center of that profession. Let God's kingdom be the primary thing that you pursue there. Because no man who gives attention to God's mandate, to God's kingdom, loses the reward. It is not possible. You cannot be interested in what God is interested in and he will not be interested in what you are interested in. It is not possible. So the key is set goals, kingdom goals for your G12, set goals for cell fellowship, cell groups, set goals for church growth, set goals. These are the things God wants to see this year. Lift up your hands. Say, Father. Can you say it aloud? Say, Father. This morning, let it be a rain of revelation. Me. Revelation like never before come through your word as the word of God comes forth. Let me see the revealed secrets, the revealed truths that it takes to enjoy grace in this year of double grace in the name of Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Have your seat and let's share words together. Amen. Amen. Now let me let you know this. Grace is man's competitive advantage. I said grace is man's word competitive. Or the Christian or the believer's competitive advantage. Without grace, you are in for disgrace. What I want to show you now is the two factors. There are primarily two factors that blocks grace. Two factors. And if you can take care of these two things, nothing can stop you. Just these two things. The first, actually, has to do with your love. Hallelujah. The first factor that suspends grace. Sorry those of you who are joining us for the first time in this series. I'm sorry I can't refresh on the previous things we've been talking about. We've done so much and we are moving on. So just join us from where you are. The first thing that determines that grace functions or not is premised on your love life. The entire New Testament is not a testament of Ten Commandments. You better get this. The entire New Testament is not a testament of the law. It has nothing to do with the law of Moses. The whole of the New Testament talks about the New Covenant. The new covenant. In Christ, we have a new covenant now. The covenant of Moses has been dealt away with. There's just one covenant we have and we're expected to function in. And that new covenant is called the covenant of love. It is called the commandment of love. 
Jesus said, a new covenant or a new commandment I give to you today. That you love your neighbors even as Christ loved you. That you love your neighbors even as I love you. Actually, the weapon the devil uses to fight you from enjoying what Christ has done is just this thing. I discovered it and I cried to God. I said, God, if there are issues I'm having with this area, please help me. If I've not yet completed this circle of love, help me here. Because it's the most dangerous spot to find yourself. Any issue in the body of Christ that has to do with strife, that has to do with unforgiveness, that has to do with hatred, that has to do with malice, that has to do with whatever, call it, you see all these issues, love issues, that have to do with relationship. Check it. That is the only issue that gives the devil license to deal with you. Also, it is the only factor that can take you to hell. This may sound very heretic, but it's true. Sin doesn't take you to hell. Let me let it digest. (sighs) You don't go to hell because you committed sin. The reason why you go to hell is because you don't function in love. Because it is love that covers the multitude of sin. It is love that takes care of sin. A new commandment have I given to you. What is that commandment? That love your neighbor even as Christ. I love you. The new commandment actually have two sides. The first side of the new commandment have to do with love for God. The second side of the new commandment have to do with love for brethren. Love for fellow men. Love for people. All sin are relational. Every sin man falls into is a relationship sin. It's either a failure in relationship with God or a failure in relationship with man. I give you an example. If I love him, I won't take what belongs to him without his knowledge. That's called stealing. Love cover it. A multitude of sin. Actually, what enhanced sin was the law. What do away with sin is love. So I'm going to deal with this first part called the love issue. It's one of the things if you don't know how to do, it can block grace. You know why some people have a very defeat, defeated image of God? Why they can't serve God? Or why they can't receive anything from Him? They don't love Him. Your failure of love for God is what is blocking your grace. And let me tell you what happens. When your love for God has become full, it overflows to men. You can't love men when your love for God has not been. Because you see, when you connect to God at a place of worship, or at a place of prayers, when you begin to know how God feels, it is how he feels about people that made him send his son. When you understand God at that level, you know you can't know a man you have not loved. Do you know I discovered in some spies, like in the SSS, there are some ladies they use as special detectives to uncover certain secrets from men. Do you know how they get those men to tell them certain things? It's to first fall in love with them. You want to get secret from this guy, oh? you want to use this, you want to, you know, this guy. I've watched a movie like that. I didn't know that this girl was a prosecutor until the movie was almost coming to an end. I was shocked. 
But you needed to see how this girl was giving attention. I love you so much. You are this. You are that. And the man kept opening up things. A weapon with which Samson was defeated with was love. It wasn't any other magic. It was just this love formula. So, the truth is you cannot claim of your love for people until your love for God overflows. You know how it functions. Let me show you how it functions. God, first of all, reveals His kindness to you. He first of all reveals His love to you. It is that revelation of His love that finally makes you an embodiment of love. When you know that somebody loves you, when you know that somebody cares for you, automatically you want to show care. Is that correct? When you know somebody is concerned about you, automatically you want to be concerned. You want to show some care. The reason why many people have a relationship problem with people is because they don't yet have a revelation of the love of God for them. They don't know God loves them. And since you don't know God loves you, you can't love Him back. And if you can't love God back, what is God's concern and interest can be your concern. That is where you see brethren who are sluggish in the service of God. The secret is simple. They are love life. You know the Bible said in the last days, the love of many is a word wax cold. The love, that is where the devil starts dealing with you. The love test is the commitment test. The love test is the giving test. The love test is the friendship test. If you want to find a man who truly loves, of course, I normally say it this way, you can give something to somebody without loving him. But you can't love without giving. One of the way love shows is that Always giving something. You see a man who loves God, he's always giving him reference. Worship. You see a man who loves so, love God, he's always winning souls. He's always in the business of getting people into the kingdom of God. He's always in the business of fellowship with brethren. He's always in the business of caring for brethren. He's always in the business of taking responsibility for certain commitments that have been put into his hands. That's how you know somebody whose love for God has been full. What makes you think God declares some people untouchable? There are some people like that he declared untouchable. One of them was Abraham. Abraham would always go on business trips and people would want to take his wife from him. Pharaoh would want to take his wife. Beautiful woman. And even when Abraham has not spoken, God will speak. Don't touch. That's my friend. Watch him. What is that thing that makes God stamp his feet on the ground and say, that guy is my friend? There's no friendship without love. What is that thing that would make God stamp his feet on the ground and say, David is a man after my heart? Can you see the limitless grace the man enjoyed? Limitless grace. I'm telling you, a lot of people have gone to hell because of this. This issue of love for God and love for the brethren is what has taken people to hell. As little as you think it is, the issue of unforgiveness, I pray that prayer. I say, Lord, everybody who I have held in my heart, I release. You guys don't know why I wasn't angry yesterday. You guys don't, you don't know yet why I came up here and I was just worshipping. Why? Concerning the issue of offense, the Bible said, woe to he offense. Now, what befalls you when you take the offense? You take it as your property. You begin to do things from happening. Are you hearing what I'm saying? 
It's a secret. If you want to keep winning in life, stay at an angle where you never get offended. No matter how people try, make a covenant this year. I made that covenant. I will not be offended. Let them keep offending you. It's their death. I say I'm going to show you this one. I'm going to be showing you plenty of scriptures. It's not my theo- It's not my philosophy. It's God's word I'm talking about here. All forgiveness has taken people to hell. So I don't want to. It's not my property. I don't want to touch it. The, the word that is on your life is woe. Make me angry. It's not my business. Who said be angry and sin not? Angry, but I refuse to sin. <laughs> because when I begin to hold grudges, that is the sin. You can be angry, but don't sin. The sin here is when the thing becomes malice. When it transmutes into, you know, Jesus understood that that thing could have cost him eternal life. It could have cost him, it could have cost him everything he labored for. Everything he labored for. That was why he was smart enough to say, Father, forgive them. For they don't know what they are doing. Why? It is not what they were doing to him that was important. It is where he was going to that was important. The issue of love. Love for God, love for the brethren. That is what determines the quantum of grace you enjoy. That is what determines the level of grace you enjoy. If you want to enjoy grace this year, you are going to have to clear off issues. Find people who you think they have done you bad, they have hurt me, they have done that, they did that. And release them. That one who is doing you bad is the one who is going to be hanged. Don't bother your life about who has done you bad or not. Release them and, f- and fulfill your whatever. Be free. Oh. Hallelujah. Is somebody with me this morning? Hallelujah. You're going to enjoy grace this year. Amen. You're going to enjoy grace. It's a, it's a known thing. I know it already. But I'm showing you how not to block it. I'm showing you know how to suspend it. I'm showing you how to enjoy the riches and the benefit of this thing. If you want to see, oof. You know, many of you don't know this thing, but that's why, thank God, the way God is taking me, when He puts me under this thing and I start learning, I say, wow. So this is just the issue. Can you see Christianity is even easy? The commandment I've given you, the whole of the New Testament is a testament of love. Nothing again. Ephesians chapter 4. Let me show you something quickly. Hmm. Okay. Let's take it from okay, let's take it from Hebrews. Let's take Hebrews. I have a lot of scriptures to read, but I would um, take a few important ones. Of course, all of them are important. All of them are important. But let me say this first of all. If you're gonna to have to go far this year, I want to warn you. Be accountable to somebody. I have to let you know this. If you're going to go far this year, give somebody the permission to deal with you. If not, you can destroy yourself. Give somebody the right to control your excesses. Have you seen a doctor who is injecting his patient? Is giving him chloroquine to cure malaria. And the stupid patient is saying, Kai, doctor, you are stupid though. If you don't remove this injection, I will slap you. I will kill you. Are you mad? Nonsense. It's not the doctor who is sick. It is you who is sick. And what you don't know is that there's, there's double sickness on your life. The first sickness is sickness of your body. The second one is sickness of your soul. Because this is the man who is supposed to be curing you. But you want to kill him. 
the man who is supposed to be helping you. It's just like Miriam and Aaron fighting their Moses. That's the same person who should be taking you into your Canaan land. Hear this. Destruction is at the root of every instruction you neglect. I say destruction is at the root or the center of every instruction you neglect. What makes me different from a doctor? If you check nothing, you know, it's about the same thing. There are certain times you need to give me authority to use knife on your body. Yes. When a doctor carries knife, his purpose for carrying it is not to destroy. It's to remove what is destroying you. So when he puts that knife around your abdomen and removes that thing that causes your appendicitis, the purpose is to get you well. It's not to destroy you. The good thing is that when he's done, he stitches that stuff back. He removes what is killing you and put it back together. But to get him to do that job, you need to submit. Effortlessly. You need to release yourself to him. You can't be telling him, no doctor, don't put the knife this way. Put it from the top. No, 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 no. Don't touch this part. I'm the one who should show you how to operate on me. No, no, no. No patient does that. Sometimes you need to be asleep. Not sleep to the way he rebukes you. The guy needs to be asleep so the guy can open that thing and do the job. Because if he's awake, if he's conscious, he can fight him. So sometimes lock your consciousness down. Shut your mouth. It would be better for you than for that man to release a curse on your life. It were better. Because if a prophet pronounces any judgment against you, no man under the sun can lift it. So I want to warn you. Anytime you have the opportunity of having a spiritual authority over your life, that opportunity can be two things. One, it can be your opportunity for greatness your opportunity for becoming successful or your opportunity for destruction. These are the two things that happens. I'm telling you the truth. You want to enjoy grace this year. Just know how to abide under. Are you hearing me? Abide under. It doesn't matter how big a tanker is. The trailer head may be small. If you don't hook to the trailer head, you're going nowhere. You're going nowhere. Glory to God. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 4. Mm, mm, mm. Is that Hebrews chapter 12? Okay, verse 14. Let me show you the instruction God gave about love. He said, pursue peace with all men. And the sanctification, the other, another translation, use holiness. Pursue peace with all men and holiness. That is why I said, basically, the issue of sin actually has a little to do with your going to heaven or your going to hell. Whether you committed sin or not, sometimes it's not so consequential. What is of bigger consequence is this thing called peace, love. When it comes to the issue, you know, those days, from the kind of parents church we grew up from, we're taught certain wrong things. For instance, we're taught things like be holy. That was okay. Be righteous. That was okay. Be sanctified. That was okay. But we're not taught how to follow peace with all men. So the kind of thing they taught us made us selective. We're always looking for people to work with. As long as you're not a brother in my church, no. You're not supposed to come along my path. As long as you don't believe in what I believe in, no. You don't have any business with me. As long as you wear trousers, no. You don't have any. As long as you put your ring, my friend, you're already in hell. Don't come close to me. Because we thought 
if we relate, we read the Bible, do not be unequally keeper. I'm going to come to that scripture some other times, not today. Because if I remove the revelation from that word, do not be unequally your you understand the grammatical just and I'll put it for you. What does it mean to be unequally yoked? It didn't say do not be equally yoked. It said do not be unequally. He said scripture for another day. Let's leave it. Let me come to what I'm talking about. Okay, let's keep reading. So we were pursuing holiness, but we were failing at the issue of following peace with all men. I said, whether the guy is a Christian or a sinner, the injunction is to be at peace with all men. Love all men. You may not have things to do with them in common. That is unequally yoked. You may not have things to share with them in common, like you don't maybe um you don't do what they do and all that. What's the commandment is to love them. See what he said though. See what he said. Without which no one will see the Lord. Can you imagine that? Without which no one. So it's not just the issue of holiness that stops you. If you like claim more the righteousness and you don't have love for brethren, you're going nowhere, my friend. You're going nowhere. See what he said in the next verse. See to it that no one comes short of the grace of God, that no root of bitterness springing up causes trouble, and by it many be defied. What defies you now is not the sin you are causing, you are committing. What actually defies you, I'm not giving licentiousness to sin. I'm going to deal with this sin issue later, anyways. I want to deal with something that is more grave that people don't know about. That is where the devil is sending people to hell. They don't understand. People are busy giving attention to what God calls 5%. And they are not giving attention to the 95%. They find see, The 5% is that thing you think is big. That sin of um, whatever you call it. Sin of armed robbery. Sin of stealing. Sin of whatever. That one is 5% though. This issue of the heart is 95%. So people are majoring on that one. As long as they don't smoke, as long as they don't drink, is good. As long as they don't do that, is all good. But as long as you don't have love for brethren, you are going nowhere. Let me show you quickly before I come back to this again. We're going to come back to this. Let's go to First Corinthians quickly. Verse 13. Let me show you the danger. Let me show you how grave this thing is. So you don't think it is all these big, 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 big things that are the big factors. Actually, it's not. It's the small things you don't know. Quickly, let me show you verse 1. If I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but do not have love, I have become a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. Get this thing, oh. Get this thing. Some of you who are functioning in high levels of anointing. Get this thing I'm saying to you now. And if I have the gift of prophecy and know all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, can you imagine? Look at one with all these things, oh. So as to remove mountains, but do not have something as small as love. There I am. And say, and if I give all my possessions to feed the poor, and if I deliver my body to be burned, but do not have love, it profits me nothing. Now, if you read from verse 4 down, you will see the various definition it gave about love, but that's not what I want to dwell right now. Let me take you to verse 13, the conclusion of the matter. Look at it now. Look at it. He said, But now abide faith. Abide hope. Abide love. These are the three most important things that will keep standing if ever that thing fails. If ever that thing fails in your life and these three things are intact, you have no feeling. But look at what he said. He said, but the greatest of this is love. So your faith, your hope, your love, the greatest commandment is love. 
Faith without love equals hellfire. Anointing without love equals hell. Prophecy without love equals hell. I am not saying love for just your fellow Christians. I am actually saying love for all men. Somebody hearing me now. I said these things have destroyed many. Let's go back to Ephesians. Let me show you. Let me show you. I want to help us this year. Oh, that's why I'm taking my time to make all this research. God is going to release unusual grace if you start working and functioning in this stuff. Because if you start checking your heart, you see that so many persons who are prisoners, you are holding bound. There are so much. There are more plenty than those in Kri-Kri. Plenty in your heart, as small as it is. You can lock up the whole world inside of it. I started, I released all. In fact, I released them last year. Plenty of them all. I said, God, what about those ones who are hurting me so much? He said, have I not taught you? There are about seven characteristics of unfaithful men. When you find such characteristics, have nothing to do with them, but love them. I can choose to allow you at the door of my house, but I can choose not to allow you inside the house. Is somebody hearing what I'm saying? So, love is being at peace with everyone. But when unfaithfulness sprouts up in our relationship, I decide the limit you go with me. Because you can kill me. Are you hearing what I'm saying? Is someone listening to me right now? These things will help you. So a lot of people are asking me, so what about those ones who have done me so badly? They've hurt me. They've done this. They've done that. I say, you can decide to severe certain contacts certain levels of approach you can keep it at arm's length possibly don't use a long spoon use a what is it called don't even use spoon at all don't use because if you use a long spoon the guy can draw the spoon and draw you in so you can just keep all the spoons away and are you hearing what I'm saying just keep it away but the commandment is be at peace let no strife let no malice, let no bitterness reside within your heart. Why? The Bible says in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14, it can cut your grace short. That's how I said it, QED. Let your grace be cut short. Let no bitterness. Maybe it's your grandmother who offended you or your father and you are still carrying me your heart. Release that guy, my friend. It's not your problem. You're your problem now. Release him. For your own good, oh, this year, release that. Release everybody. They did something to you. Maybe somebody, it was a rape case. I've seen people like that who were raped and they told me, Pastor, I can't forgive for any reason. I won't forgive. Somebody did you something so bad and you're holding it. And that person releases it. And it's like, God, forgive me, forgive. And all that. Can't you see the Lord's prayer? Jesus said, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Men would trespass against you, but your job is to forgive, no matter the gravity. Because that's the basis. When God said, or when Jesus was saying, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those, it doesn't necessarily mean forgive me for the, for the, from the sin I committed. Trespasses can be anything. What does trespass mean? Crossing boundary. You know, poverty can be a trespass. Are you, are you hearing what I'm saying? When poverty crosses the line of grace, it's trespass. Because the seed of the righteous shall not bear bread. So when you begin to go broke and go in lack, then there has been what? A trespass. The guy trespass. What it means is he crossed his boundary. Now, the consequence of that is that grace was cut short by one simple thing unforgiveness, lack of love. So, when you say, Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those, it means, Lord, 
as I forgive this person, let this poverty that trespass be taken away. Let this lack that trespass be taken away. Let this failure that trespassed be taken. Is on that premises that your prayers are answered. The Bible said, when you come before the presence of God and you have an offering to give, and you remember that somebody who has done you wrong, he said, the first thing to do is go back, make peace. You, you did me wrong, oh, but I forgive you. Or maybe you were the one who did wrong, I'm sorry. Let it go. If the person refuses to forgive you, you are already justified. And you hear what I'm saying? Now, you may be safe, but sir, what about the ones that have done wrong and they don't want to forgive me? They are the ones who are prisoners now to themselves. You are no longer a prisoner. Your job is to go and beg. I'm sorry. If you have the opportunity to meet the person, fine. If you don't know how to meet the person, you go with somebody and the person is still proving, release it to God. God, I've done my bit. I've done my bit. It's okay. God declares you justified. No judgment is on you again. This thing is both for your profit here on earth and your eternal destiny. I am begging you, my children, to go far this year. Suspend it. Let's look at this Ephesians chapter 5 quickly. Oh, glory to God. From verse 1. Look at what Jesus said, what Paul was saying to the church. He said, Therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children. There's one thing God is. And Paul's instruction was that we imitate who he is. Be imitators of God. He didn't mention a million and one things to imitate. He mentioned just one thing because that is the one thing God is. God is love. And Paul was talking to the Ephesian church. He said, imitate God. What does it mean? Imitate love. The imitators of God. See verse 2 that quickly. And walk in love. Just as Christ also loved you. And gave himself up for us. An offering and a sacrifice to God. As a fragment. As a fragrant aroma. Can you see the instruction? Walk in love. It doesn't matter what the person did to you. Walk in love. It doesn't matter how much the person offended you. Walk in love. They ask Jesus, how many times must people offend me before I forgive and all that? Why? He says, 70 times. What? Seven times. Do their mathematics. It's not possible. All your lifetime, how can somebody, you know, keep offending you, keep offending you like that? It means there's a problem with you too. And you catch what I'm saying. <laughs> Are you hearing me? So he said, what Jesus was trying to say was, uncountable times. Uncountable times. They were trying to hear, um, once. When the person offends you once and you forgive, the next time you retaliate. Because Moses was saying eye for an eye, tooth for an, a tooth, arm for an arm. So if somebody beats you and removes two teeth, you have to count how many person you remove. I, I can open yours. It's two you took. I'm going to take two. You must take exactly what the person took. No addition, no subtraction. If you mistakenly take three, why he took two? The, the guy is going to take the third. <laughs> Can you imagine that kind of life? Jesus said, no. If the guy slaps you here, yeah, my friend, turn the other place. Let him slap you. If he takes one land, go and show him another plot somewhere. Let's take him. Say, come, you remember, no. My father actually left this one here. You've not finished taking this. Come and take this one too. <laughs> For your own good. <laughs> Glory to God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Are we getting blessed? Am I helping somebody here right now? That's the key. It has stopped a lot of people. And I know what I'm saying. It has. This year of double grace, nothing will stop you. I didn't hear your amen. amen. Hallelujah. Okay, okay. I, I, I really want to run this quickly because... um I don't have all the time. Oh, I don't have all the time. I don't have all the time. Okay, I want to get to the second thing. But before I get to the second thing, because I want to make this service as brief as possible, let me let you know something about your love for God and man. What Jesus came 
on earth to do was to reconcile man back to God and reconcile man back to man. Hear me again. The primary goal of Jesus here on earth was to reconcile God or reconcile man back to God and reconcile man back to man. You see that law of Moses is severe relationship between God and between men. That law of Moses he did a lot though. He did a lot. When somebody blows your teeth, my friend, and you blow the person's teeth back, automatically what has happened? Relationship has been severed. Hmm? You're revenged. How can you be at peace? But when somebody blows your teeth and you say to the person, thank you, God bless you, and you walk away, and you still love the person in spite of whatever. You see, all war problems, all terrorism you see on earth, all kinds of name it crisis, uh, land disputes, and all that. All kinds of, you know what I'm talking about? Battles, riot, oppression, aggression, force, violence. All those stuff are love problems. Any nation that enthrones love, stay in peace. Any nation, any people that walk in love, stay in harmony. Not walking in love is actually a virus. It's a poison. What you don't know is that this poison kills slowly. Bitterness is a poison. I can give you so many effects, health effects of bitterness. One of it is aging, quick aging. One of it is um, cancer, right? Okay, yes, I have medical practitioners here. Another one is what? Wrinkles. Yes, it's associated with aging. Aging. I didn't say ag. I I said aging. Good. They are my friends. Hallelujah. Another one is high blood pressure. It's not high blood pleasure. <laughs> it's got high blood pressure. <laughs> if you don't want high blood pressure, <laughs> stay away from bitterness. I'm talking about not spiritual now, my friend. Just health, physical. <laughs> to tell you how dangerous it is. Yes, give me more, give me more. Another one is one. Okay, high blood pressure would be, so they even give, they, they have the ability to get pregnant too. Okay, so when it gets pregnant, it conceives it gives <laughs> stroke. Are you hearing me? What is a young guy doing with stroke? Go and check. He has issues with um, bitterness. These things are not hard for me. Sir, my father is suffering from stroke. Why is he suffering from stroke? I don't know. He's just retired. He has enemies. I said, that's the that's reason. He's just retired as a principal. Or he just retired as a school headmaster. How many years in service? 35 years in service. Stroke just came. I said, check that man's record from the day he was made teacher or principal. He was always having problems with his teacher. He was always having problems with his staff. He was always having issues. Those are the ones who are endangered with stroke. In the office, every time wahala, you are the one who everybody, you must have problem. Anybody who has not had problem with you have not done IT in that office. He has not done his... They must do IT. And that IT is that they must have problems. You are the one who is always telling people who come into the office. In this office, if you don't have a problem with me, know that there's something wrong with you. The way to show that you're alright is that you must have issues with me. Can you imagine that? What those ones, they're the ones who retire and finally is die young go. Stroke comes. Bitterness. Tying up your emotions. Tying up your creativity. You see people who function in that bitterness thing, they hardly think well. They can't create, they are, they don't, you know, it's of releasing, you know, they are creative hormones. 
Are you aware of that? Instead of releasing those creative hormones that helps you function well, you release those ones that rises your, you know, and all that. And people will notice you can't even think clearly. No sound mind. No sound mind because you're carrying somebody in your heart. And maybe the person you're carrying is also, is just being free with his life, he's doing his stuff and all that. You, why are you carrying? You're carrying. No? For the continuation of this message, please play the next track.